All right, so take two. I was hoping not to have to uh, do this a second time, and I'm noticing now maybe I shouldn't have worn a white shirt. Um, <laughs> it was turning green, the other light that was on earlier uh, would turn the whole screen green uh, because of the white balance or whatever it is that the science tells us is the reason. So anyway, I turned that light off, and hopefully it's not going to happen again. Um, so I just learned uh, in the last hour or so um, that um, the diocese, at least this diocese, and it's probably going to be true in, in many other dioceses if it's not true already, is they've canceled uh, not just public masses, but they've canceled confession. So um, I have been defending sort of the, the move, uh, the prudential move, I think, to cancel masses. And I know it's upset quite a few Catholics, faithful Catholics out there because they have, you know, part of their or, or, or a lot of their, their spirituality is, is tied into um, the physical attendance presence at uh, in the sacred uh, places of the church and um, but we know, you know that in certain circumstances that uh, or at least a lot of folks know I think if you're really sick uh, you're dispensed from your um, your um, obligation to to attend Sunday mass um, and so in some sort of similar fashion, I think in reverse, it's the rationale is still, I think it holds uh, that if you have, you know, an epidemic going on, um, it's, prud it's prudent to, to, uh, to cancel masses, I think, uh, because um, you don't receive any less grace uh, by not attending mass either because you personally are sick and you can't make it to mass. Or the fact that the masses are not available because you have spiritual communion available to you or you have extraordinary means of receiving communion at times. Uh, if you live in very remote regions, you can't, you probably can't attend mass very often, maybe once a, a year, once every six months, once a month, something like that, where the priest can come through or, or you have the, the, the liturgy uh, celebrated far off and then you have extraordinary, true extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion uh, for in those circumstances where <coughs> they can distribute communion to those uh, individuals that are far off in, in, in remote regions. Um, so not everybody can can benefit from attending Mass every day or every Sunday, right? And we also know um, in history, uh, during Reformation times, um, you pretty much, the, the, the Mass was outlawed in those countries, and so you couldn't receive uh, communion or, or go to Mass. Uh, are you any less of a Catholic if, uh, if you can't, if in those circumstances you couldn't receive communion? It was outlawed. No, for centuries. Also, you had uh, in Japan um, no mass, and so you, you know the missionaries that came uh, back uh, centuries later and found that the Catholic faith was still strong in Japan, in spite of the fact that there was no mass, was was a surprise to them, and yet. Hey, there you are. And so, you know, all the, all the you know, um, good hearted, I guess, um, individuals that are really upset that they've canceled the masses. I can understand. I, I sympathize for you. But, you know, um, these are not uh, normal times. And so let's uh, support our uh, leaders in the church. We're trying to make prudential decisions, not just pastorally, but also uh, abiding by the law uh, that is being um, imposed um, you know, for public health reasons, right? So, and of course, some of you are going to say, well, you know, it's a it's an unjust law and, you know, we should fight back or whatever. But, you know, it's easy for us to say we're the lay people, right? It's easy for us to say, let's go create a, a revolution or whatever. But at what cost, at what expense, at, at the expense of some of us uh, getting sick and spreading the, the, the you know, the, the disease even further? I mean... You know, it. You know, a lot of us are able-bodied young folks, and we probably won't get sick. If we do get sick, we'll get over it, right? But you fail to recognize sometimes that that you might be a carrier. You might not even have symptoms, and because your interaction with individuals that are in uh, high-risk categories, you might inadvertently transmit it to those individuals. So, um, you know. Anyway, I'll just say that. Yeah, just you know, we have to just be. Um, very careful <laughs> uh, in our, you know, underestimation of, of the gravity of this situation, right? Um, because even individuals that have, you know, have just thought this was a hype 
um, it just even a week ago, um, are slowly seeing um, the impacts uh, in, in the world around us. So, um, so I, I learned recently they canceled confessions, at least in this diocese. It's probably true in other dioceses, dioceses uh, <laughs> elsewhere, if not now and, and in the future. Um, and so, a parallel concept of of uh, I would say a parallel concept of, you know, spiritual communion, which I think people already are, are familiar with, are aware of, is the concept of uh, perfect contrition. And I don't know if that's still being taught in catechism classes or, or whatever. Um, I know when I was a catechist, I would talk about it, but but who knows? I don't know if it's part of CCD or whatever it is. And so I think um, that's why I'm making this video, because there's a parallel concept there as far as spiritual communion. So you might not be able to go to communion, but you, you have uh, spiritual communions and you're not receiving any less grace uh, by, by, you know, um, uh, performing acts of, um, uh, of a spiritual communion. Um, uh, you're receiving the same grace because the fruit of of the mass is i mean the mass is truly i mean is really christ offering uh the sacrifice or, or representing the sacrifice perpetually in heaven um and the the individual masses that are happening all around the world right um private masses at this point probably in many places uh are 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 in are that same is that same one mass right and so so when we receive grace from receiving communion it's a, it's the grace that's a fruit of that sacrifice of christ on the cross that's offered on the altars in time perpetually until the end of time so so we're still receiving that grace even though we are not geographically present uh at a mass itself um and it's still happening i mean as far you know all the priests that i know are still offering private <coughs> masses in, in their homes or whatever it is uh but not public masses where the public are are present and so you can still reap the benefits of the of the fruit of that sacrifice of christ on the cross in the mass uh perpetuated in the mass uh you know in no in no less of of a way that if you were actually at the at the, at the church itself and so yeah i mean you're, you're there's there's certain uh, things that are lacking obviously you're not benefiting from the the ambiance of a church the the smells and the bells and the incense and the candles and the holy pictures and the uh, crucifixes and things like that or the vestments you're not edified by those those things uh but those are sort of mm, peripheral uh they're part of the the meal but they're not the meal itself i guess you can say or or, or um, it enhances. I guess it's like MSG or salt or whatever it enhances the flavor of the of the of, of, of the uh, sacrifice, but but it's not necessarily essential. I guess you can say. So when it comes to confession, right? So you, well, what is sin? Well, sin is is, is essentially it's an offense of, to to um, to God, right? So it's it's transgression of God's law. And you can open up or Google any kind of examination of conscience and what you'll find in those lists. Uh, it typically goes into the Ten Commandments. It goes into the Beatitudes. It goes into the uh, precepts of the church. Those are the typical lists that you'll find in an examination of consciences. Uh, those are the mortal sins, you could say, right? And so venial sins are, 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 are light sins, if you will, that are not mortal sins. Mortal sins are what you have to confess in confession, in when you confess. So, okay, all of us are born with original sin, right? So we know that, right? So baptism, uh, at baptism, we are forgiven of that original sin. We are infused with the theological virtues of, of faith, hope, and charity, uh, all that stuff you probably already know. Um, and so we're saints <laughs> we're saved at that moment right but after baptism the commission uh i suppose or, or i suppose even omission right so you can you can sin by by commission and omission right um of mortal sins so mortal sins that are in those categories in those um uh, examinations of conscience um <clears throat> destroys the life of of grace in our souls right and so it, it separates us right it destroys that relationship we have with god in terms of, of justification right so that, that, that idea that concept of justification so we're right with god if we were to die at the moment 
uh, and we're justified, we would go to heaven. We might have a brief pit stop in purgatory, but we would be justified. We'd be going to heaven. But if you commit mortal sin, it destroys that life of grace. And so it separates us uh, from, from uh, union with God. And so we must go to sacramental, we must go to confession uh, to, to restore that um, uh, relationship with God, right? So I think most everybody already knows about that piece. Um, venial sins, you don't have to. I mean, sacramentals can forgive um, some sacramentals, like even just dipping your finger in the holy water uh, forgives venial sins. Uh, you could uh, say, you know, certain prayers, it forgives venial sin. You do, it's not required to 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 confess venial sins. Uh, you're not, you're, the life of grace is not destroyed uh, when you are, uh, when you commit venial sin. So you could still, you're still justified. You're in a state of grace still. You can receive Holy Communion. You cannot receive Holy Communion if you're not in a state of grace. You have mortal sin on your soul. So you have to go to confession, right? And so confession has to be auricular. It has to be heard face to face. Well, I shouldn't say face to face. It should be sort of in person, I guess is what I'm saying. You can't do it over the phone is what I'm saying or email or Zoom or Skype or whatever it is, right? You have to be present in the vicinity of the priest because the priest has to give absolution and uh, so it has to be sort of geographically uh, close, I suppose, um, you could say. Uh, so so what do we do in this time that we don't have a priest? You can't go to confession unless you're in danger of death, right? So what I'm saying is there's a parallel concept to, to uh, spiritual communion, which is uh, perfect contrition, which maybe a lot of folks Maybe, maybe some folks don't know about it. So uh, that's why I'm making this video. So I, I have a few resources here and I just quickly pulled them off my shelves because I think it's important to share this information with you. So the first resource I would share is this. I, I just probably can't see because it's backwards. Uh, maybe there's a way for you to see it um, flipped uh, when you actually watch the video. But anyway, so this comes from uh, Father James Buckley. He's an FSSP. I think once upon a time he was a Jesuit. Um, I got, I had the benefit of meeting him when I visited the FSSP when I was discerning um, almost 10 years ago. Um, so I think that's when I picked up this book. So in this book, uh, Catechism for Making Good Confession, I'll just read it to you because, you know, straight to the straight from the horse's mouth, I guess you can say. So he writes, uh, Father James Buckley writes, quote, There are two kinds of sin that a man can commit, mortal sin and venial sin. Mortal sin is a grievous offense against the law of God, which destroys the life of sanctifying grace. Venial sin is a less serious offense, which does not destroy the life of sanctifying grace. Because the sacrament of penance was instituted to restore the life of grace lost by sin, the distinctive purpose of this sacrament is to remove mortal sin. Consequently, a penitent must confess each one of his mortal sins. He must therefore not only tell the priest the kind of mortal sin that he has committed, but also the number of times he has committed it. Moreover, the Catechism of the Council of Trent insists that, quote, 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 we should not be satisfied with the bare enumeration of our mortal sins, but should mention such circumstances as considerably aggravate or extenuate their malice. Thus, if one man killed another, he must state whether his victim was a layman or an ecclesiastic. Or if he has had sinful relations with a woman, he must state whether the female was married or unmarried, a relative or a person consecrated to God by vow. These circumstances change the nature of the sin, end quote. Continuing with Father Buckley, one may confess venial sins, but is not obliged to do so. If the penitent has no mortal sin to confess, however, the confession of a venial sin is sufficient for the grace of the sacrament. One may also confess sins that have already been forgiven. Pope Benedict XI said that although there is no necessity of confessing sins against, nevertheless we, <clears throat> again, sorry, again, nevertheless we judge it salutary, salutary that the confession of the same sins be repeated because of the shame, which is a great part of penance. <clears throat> One more paragraph, sorry. The removal of mortal sins, which is a purpose of the sacrament of penance, also explains its necessity. The Council of Trent said, quote, For those who have lapsed after baptism, the sacrament of penance is as necessary for salvation as the sacrament of baptism for those not yet baptized. For those who fall into mortal sin, there is no other means for salvation than the remission of this sin. But the remission of mortal sin can only be found by the power of the keys exercised in the sacrament of penance, right? So, <clears throat> um, I believe the classic apologetic 
for confession. It's in the Bible, right? Uh, confess your sins to one another. Uh, is in the first epistle of John, I believe, at the end, chapter 20. So if that's not correct, fine. I'm pretty sure somebody's going to correct me. Look it up. You, you, anybody can Google apologetics, Catholic apologetics for, for confession. It's it's in one of John's writings. I don't think it's in the gospel. It's, it's funny. It's first John 20 something at the end. Um, so there are a few other things I want to share um, just to elaborate further. Um, so he, uh, so Father Buckley doesn't really go further into um because he, he's, what he's what he's what he's selling is 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 sacramental confession and why it's so important because this is basically a a, a um, examination of conscience. He doesn't get into perfect contrition, which is kind of what I'm talking about here, because you can't access confession unless you're a danger of death in this diocese of San Bernardino for 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 the circumstances that we're in now. So the first thing I pulled off my shelf, and I'm pretty sure I have tons of other books. I have like 2,000, 3,000 books out there uh, on my shelves, and I don't, I haven't read all of them. Um, I haven't read most of them, to be honest with you. I've spot read quite a few of them. Uh, and I don't know um, what other books that might be even more appropriate to talk about this stuff, but, um, or to support my case here. Um, and so, uh, anyway, the first thing I pulled off my shelf was this book. Uh, it's one of the first Catholic books when I first came back to the Catholic Church. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little bright. So, Our Sunday Visitors, Encyclopedia of Catholic Doctrine. Uh, it's not quite a traditionalist book, but Our Sunday Visitors is not too bad, actually. Uh, who's it edited by? Russell Shaw. So, he's, uh, I believe Russell Shaw is a, oh, I shouldn't say. Some of you might um, <laughs> um, throw it out uh, just by knowing his association. But uh, anyway, he's a member of Open Day, whatever. So it's pretty conservative, uh, to say the least. So um, in this section, and it's a section on this encyclopedia on sin. Uh, let me see what the article is called. Sin. Let's see, let's page 627, starting on 627. But... It starts talking about perfect contrition here. So I'm just going to read the section that's relevant, I guess. Um, Those not in their present circumstances able to receive the sacrament of reconciliation can receive forgiveness even of the gravest sins by sincere acts of a perfect kind of contrition, that is, by a sorrow rooted in the love of God, when this sorrow is associated with a resolution to come to sacramental confession as soon as possible, those who do not know of the necessity of the sacrament may receive forgiveness by acts of perfect contrition, which would implicitly involve the, a willingness to do all the Lord requires. Since mortal sin is an evil with such bitter consequence, the teacher of faith must instruct people in ways of avoiding it. Often people travel the path of mortal sin by way of venial sins. Venial sins are less serious sin, less serious than mortal sin because they are less evil kinds of acts such as impatient words or somewhat selfish acts, acts that are neither in the service of love nor simply incompatible with love of God and neighbor. So maybe hoarding toilet paper, for example, is a venial sin. I don't know. Maybe it's a mortal sin, according to some priests. Um, or sin can be venial even if the act is of a gravely sinful kind, if one is less guilty because he acted without sufficient knowledge or freedom. Oh, so that's another point that's very important. You need to uh, recognize, um, so, so mortal sin, so whatever it is that is uh, arguably a mortal sin, depending on which examination of conscience you're using. Um, <clears throat> there's three conditions um, that make it mortal, right? So it has to be a grave matter. You had to you had to have knowledge that it was a grave matter, and you freely did it, right? So if there's any deficit in those three, obviously if it's not grave matter, it's not a mortal sin. If you didn't have knowledge of it, um, then how could you be responsible for a law that you weren't aware uh, was a law? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, but you could have all, uh, certainly been um, um, deficient in the sense of uh, not um, educating yourself when you had access to the materials of, of knowing what a mortal sin was. And so you might have uh, other transgressions there of, of not uh, uh, availing yourself of that information. So, so again, uh, more, um, mortal sin requires that it's, it's grave matter, knowledge of it as, as being grave offense, a grave offense. And then you have to freely do it. So if there's any circumstance that uh, limits your your free exercise of your will or whatever it is, and you did it out of coercion or 
or manipulation or something like that, it might mitigate some of that responsibility for that mortal sin. Um, a great example, which I think we've only in the recent uh, decades have have appreciated is is mental illness, right? So there was a time where if you um, you uh, had a successful suicide, right, you wouldn't be able to access a a, a um, you know burial rites or or having a funeral in the church or or being um, buried in in a Catholic cemetery because it was seen as a mortal sin to take your own life. Well. With the uh, uh, the advent of psychology, I guess, or, or or the understanding that there are mental uh, <clears throat> processes going on, which kind of limit uh, perhaps the the uh, free exercise of of your will in 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 the actual commission of of taking your own life or even somebody else's life, it might mitigate the gravity of that uh, or your responsibility. Or culpability is another word for that sin itself. So you can delve deeper into those concepts. You do that on your own time. Um, catechism of the Catholic Church, right? So again, a lot of traditionalists probably won't like these quotes, but hey, you know, it's still in line with the tradition of teaching of the church. Why not? Or I shouldn't say not like the quotes, but not like the source, right? That is the Catholic Church. This is the second edition. I don't know if they came up with a third edition, but in any case, on page 364 of at least this edition, uh, I should say the paragraph then. Um, let's see. Paragraph uh, 1450 to 1454 under a heading that says the Acts of the Penitent, right? Uh, on the subheading Contrition. Uh, so starting at 1451, among the penitents' acts, contrition occupies first place. Contrition is sorrow of the soul and detestation for the sin committed together with a resolution not to sin again. When it arises from a love by which God is loved above all else, contrition is called perfect contrition of charity. Such contrition remits venial sin. It also obtains forgiveness of mortal sins if it includes the firm resolution to have recourse to sacramental confession as soon as possible. So yeah, that's the one thing. So right, so uh, commit an act of perfect contrition, um, as described in the two things I've already read, right? But you also have to have this uh, intention to to go to sacramental confession as soon as possible, as soon as it's made available. So whenever this ban or whatever you call it is lifted uh, in this and other dioceses, uh, then you can certainly, um, you, you would certainly ha uh, have an obligation to then receive communion. In a similar fashion, like if you're in a uh, life-threatening situation there's a priest available he might be able to uh, he might do a what's called a, what do they call it a, a um, universe I forgot the term uh, absolution like um, it's universal absolution I forget what the term is it's some kind of absolution where he doesn't hear each individuals like you're in a sinking ship or you're in the World Trade Center and you're a priest and you know we you know your time is up Right. And so the priest is there and, and, and if he's, you know, has the clarity of mind, um, you know, he'll just give, um, you know, universal is it called um, universal absolution, whatever it's called. <laughs> Look it up. I'm sure you can find it. Um, he's able to give absolution without hearing your confession with the assumption that if you survive through the sinking ship, you would go to confession and confess all of those mortal sins, uh, right? So it, 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 you're then responsible for going to confession again, or going to confession the first time um, for those sins, even though you've already been absolved of those sins. So, uh, so anyway, there is a reference here, uh, reference 51. When you look at reference 51, it says Council of Trent, 1551. That's probably the year. And then it has reference to DS 1677. So that's usually Denzinger reference. So Denzinger is, is a book. Um, and so my first Denzinger was this book um, published by Laredo Press, right? So you might have this on your shelves, Denzinger. Uh, it's also called... Um, Enchiridion Symbolorum, uh, if you want to be fancy in Latin and impress some people, I guess. Uh, not so impressive these days. There's a lot more people who do apologetics and Latin studies and stuff, so it's not impressive as it was 10 years ago when I was doing this stuff. So um, the thing is, 
when you look at, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out why this doesn't align. So this is the, this is the last edition of, of not the last edition, but this is like the 1960s edition of the Denzinger. And I looked at 1677 and there is no reference, um, to, to, to venial sin or mortal sin or, or perfect contrition in this, in this book. Um, and so, but, but I did find something interesting here. So I'll go back to this. So I, I actually had a discussion with a friend of mine. Um, I guess he would consider himself a friend of mine. We were talking about limbo and the, and, and the, the idea of limbo. I wouldn't say doctrine or dogma of limbo because it's never been defined, right? So I said, well, read the Denzinger or whatever. So he found a, a, a modern or new edition in Latin and English published by uh, Ignatius Press. Anyway, so you, um, I think it just came out a few years ago. So it's a cool volume, much larger. Uh, if you want to impress more people, it has the Latin in it. Uh, but, you know, it, it is here. So for whatever reason, the new Denzinger numbers refer to this latest edition, but not the old Denzinger. So I guess if you're looking at an older document prior to the publication of this, it would reference the numbers that are, or the, uh, you know, the, the, the numerical convention that this old edition. Anyway, so 1677 says this. Um, and it comes from the Council of Trent, quote, moreover, the council teaches that although it, at, sorry, moreover, the council teaches that although it sometimes happens that this contrition is perfect through charity and reconciles man to God before the sacrament is actually received, this reconciliation nevertheless is not to be ascribed to contrition itself without the desire of the sacrament, a desire that is included in it, right? So, um, so, so it, it, it harkens this, this, this language of desire thereof. Um, it's also parallel to, you know, the, the debate on, um, the three modes, actually modes, the, um, uh, basically there are, there's a group of traditionalist Catholics who reject the idea of baptism of blood, baptism of desire. They're called the Feniites and they, they, don't, they don't call themselves this because it's, it's like a, derogatory term, but folks, traditionalists call this, this group of traditionalists the Feniites. They follow the teachings, at least uh, at some point, the teachings of Father Leonard Feeney, who was a, um, a priest. Of, I, don't, I don't know what order he was a priest of. Anyway, um, he there's, there's still some groups that are associated with his, his lineage, I guess you can say, of his teaching. Uh, and some of them have reconciled, I guess, fully with the church or whatever. Maybe that's not the right term either. Some of you will hate that term because it sounds like the like they're schismatic or something like that. But any, in any case, they reject the idea of baptism of blood, baptism of desire. And if you look at the Council of Trent and, and, and the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it talks about um, the necessity of baptism or its desire, right? So there it is in the Council that that you can be baptized either by water or if in circumstances where you cannot get to the water you are baptized in in the in the in the sense of, of the desire for it the desire of it the desire for baptism and, and not being able to actually getting water baptized is of the same level as or the same has the same effect, I guess you can say, as uh, water baptism, right? And so this language seems to hark in the same kind of concept. So, so I, my point is to say, conf confession uh, forgives one of mortal sin, or in extraordinary circumstances like the one we're in now, uh, the desire for it uh, is of the same level. Uh, but of course, you need to um, run to the sacrament of confession as soon as you can, whenever it is readily available. So I did look up in this old um, edition of the of the sources of Catholic dogma, Danzinger, and I looked up Council of Trent. So I found this section. So if you have this older edition, you could probably start reading it. Uh, chap, um, page 255, um, reference number 807 and following, or within this paragraph. Um, it says, quote, hence it must be taught that the repentance of a Christian after his fall is very different from that at his baptism, and that it includes not only a cessation from sins and a detestation of them, or a contrite and humble heart, Psalm 59, 19, but also the sacramental confession of the same, at least in desire 
and to be made in its season and sacerdotal absolution, as well as satisfaction by fasting, almsgiving, prayers, and other devout exercises of the spiritual life, not indeed for the eternal punishment, which is remitted together with the guilt either, either by the sacrament or the desire of the sacrament, but for the temporal punishment, Canon 30, which, as the sacred writings teach, is not always wholly remitted, as is done in baptism, to those who ungratefully, to the grace of God, which they have received, have received, have grieved the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, and have not feared to violate the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3.17. Anyway, to summarize, I'm already at 30 minutes. Holy cow. Anyway, um, is that a sin to say that? Holy cow. Um, anyway, um, so to summarize, <laughs> uh, Sin is transgression against God's law. There are two kinds of sin. There's venial sin, there's mortal sin. Venial sin, you don't have to confess. They're lighter sins. Uh, they are forgiven through things like dipping your finger in the holy water, doing the sign of the cross. Other kinds of prayers will forgive venial sin. You can look that up. Mortal sin is what you need to confess, right? Those are the sins that you'll find in any examination, any good examination of consciences. Examination of conscience uh, books, uh, and they typically go through the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, the precepts of the church, lists like that, right? Um, so those are what you need to confess. So under normal circumstances, you need to confess your sins to a priest, you know, geographically close to them in person, right? They need to hear. It's auricular. It needs to be heard. It can't be over the phone. It can't be through Skype or any of these other, uh, you know, uh, methods. Um, and you get, um, you know, you have to hear the absolution and he needs to give you some sort of penance to satisfy the temporal, um, you know, right? So, so there are, there are two effects of sin, mortal sin. There is the spiritual effect. There's the temporal effect, right? It's the offense against God, which is forgiven at absolution, right? So that's fine. But then there's sort of the temporal effects of sin, which you need to make up for. Uh, in the form of like, if you stole money, then you have to pay it back. If you have, you know, you know um, I don't know, whatever the whatever the priest assigns you to satisfy for that temporal uh, offense, right? The temporal side of the offense. So, so there's that. Um, but under uh, extraordinary circumstances, uh, like a circumstance we're in, confession is not available. You need to um, be able to. Um, your only recourse at this point would be to have perfect contrition, which I've read all the resources. So, so if you're only re listening to this part of it, rewind. Uh, perfect contrition is. Um, well, I, I'm not going to repeat myself. It's already. I already talked about it. You could. You could. Um, you do that, and you. So I'm already getting fatigued now. At this point you have to also have this desire for uh, receiving sacramental confession as soon as possible once confession is um, available um, again uh, readily, right? So uh, hopefully that was a good summary. I'm not sure. I, my mind is already, you know, I had a long day of work so already so far. So hopefully this video was helpful. Uh, I'll end it now because it's already approaching 34 minutes so god bless you and stay safe wash your hands for 20 seconds at least uh don't congregate in more than yourself right don't unnecessarily uh you know uh just to 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 be um in support of everyone trying to get over this this crisis or whatever it is that's going on. Let's get it over with as soon as possible. The longer we drag our feet and resist, it takes longer to get over this if we're not all cooperating with each other. And of course, um, uh, and of course, uh, take advantage of your spiritual tools, not just your um, medical scientific tools. God bless you and good night.